Welcome to our second video on trusses. This is from chapter 7, section 1, subsection 2, in which we're going to apply the so-called exploded analysis to a parallel chord truss with four square bays. In the exploded analysis, we will draw an exploded view of the truss where every joint is a standalone free body and every member is a standalone free body which allow us, us to apply principles of equilibrium to every joint and to every member. Performing the analysis in this mode provides the following possibilities. All the forces on all the joints will be properly accounted for. All the forces on all the members will be properly accounted for. The magnitude of the forces will be represented by properly scaled arrows. The principle of equilibrium will be fully expressed in the sense that the equilibrium of every joint and every member will be accounted for and the principle of action-reaction pairs will be fully expressed in that the exchange of forces between members and the joints to which they are attached will be properly accounted for. So it looks something like this. We have four square bays with diagonal web members um, there's a 1p force on all the interior vertices, a half a p force on the two end vertices. Um, that's a total of 4p downward. Uh, that means we have to have a reaction of 2p upward at each end. So this is a very simple diagram of everything that's going on on that truss. We're now going to take that truss and explode it. So this little segment right here becomes that segment there. That little segment right there of the top cord becomes this. That vertex becomes that. That vertex becomes that. That one becomes that. And so forth. So, actually we've th shown only three bays exploded in order to make it easy to read. And by the symmetry of it, we know what's going on in this bay is going to be equal to what's going on in that bay. So we haven't bothered to draw in the fourth bay. So this joint is being projected down to there, and that joint is being projected to there. Now the first thing that we have to do is we have to put onto the exploded diagram all the forces that exist on the initial truss. So for example, on that joint, we have a 1p force. On that joint, we have a 1p force. This joint, a 1p force. And on this member, we have a half p force. And then on the bottom cord vertices or joints, we have a 2p force here. And then we don't have any external forces applied to any of these three joints and then down at the end we'd have another joint with a 2p reaction on it but as i said we're blowing this up so it's uh, fairly easy to see now we're going to simplify by getting rid of the original diagram and we're left with this and now we want to apply some equations of equilibrium in order to um, figure out what's going on internal to this. In other words, we've exploded it out so that we can draw forces on joints and forces on members. And we need to start somewhere where we know a fair amount and there's a fair amount that we don't need to know. So when I look at a joint like this, for example, I see an interaction with this member, which is unknown, an interaction with this member, and both a horizontal and vertical component associated with this member. So there's just a bunch of stuff going on up here uh, 
and not much information there. There are too many unknowns. There's an unknown here, an unknown there, and essentially two unknowns here, although one of those unknowns is going to be pretty simple because uh, to get rid of because we've said the forces in this member have to be along the length of the member. So whatever force is being exerted on the member by this joint is along the axis of the member and by action-reaction pairs this member has to be reacting backward on that joint and that force also has to be along the line of action because the acting and the reacting force have to be the same. So we really have three unknowns. We have an unknown vertical here, an unknown horizontal, and this diagonal force um, has one unknown to it. Uh, the other can be determined geometrically in the sense that whatever the vertical component is along this diagonal, the horizontal component will be of the same magnitude because this is a square bay. That means this is at 45 degrees uh, relative to the vertical and relative to the horizontal. And in order to get a force along that 45 degree line, the horizontal and vertical components of that force have to be equal to each other. But we're not going to start up there because it's pretty obvious we don't have enough information and we have even worse problems here and there um, and at these joints down on the bottom. So we're going to come look at this joint right here. The reason it's appealing is there's no diagonal member framing into it. And so we can apply the rules of equilibrium at that joint. Um, and we're going to do it in the following way. We're going to say in order for this joint to be in equilibrium, it has this 2p reaction force. In order for it to be in equilibrium, there has to be a 2p force downward to equilibrate that upward force. And that 2p force is being exerted by this member because it's the only agent that can exert such a force. So the equilibrium of this, this joint relative to vertical forces is fairly easy to account for. There is one known force and there is one unknown and they have to be equal and opposite. So we've drawn this downward force 2p on the joint due to the member. Now by action reaction pairs, if there's a 2p force down on the joint being exerted by that member, then the member has to be exerting a 2p upward force on the member. The joint must be exerting a 2p force up on the member by action-reaction pairs. So these two forces were equal by vertical equilibrium requirements on the joint. This force <coughs> and that one are equal by action-reaction pairs. Now, it's, it's really important that you start verbalizing for yourself the difference between action-reaction pairs and equilibrium. And I almost suggest that you do this kind of studying in a closet where you can talk and you can speak and you let your words reinforce ideas as opposed to you sit somewhere quietly in the library or in your studio and try and read it, but don't reinforce it. These are really important concepts and they're really basic and you'd like to have this verbal repetition to reinforce the concepts. All right, equilibrium of the joint assures that these two forces has to be equal. Action-reaction pairs governing the interaction between this member and that joint require that this force and that force be equal. In other words, this 2p downward force exerted by that member on that joint must be equal and opposite to the force that the joint is exerting upward on the member. Now by equilibrium, in order for this member to be in equilibrium, it has a 2p upward force on the bottom. It has to have a 2p downward force on the top. So this force is equal to that by equilibrium. This downward force is exerted by that joint. That joint is the only agent that connects to the end of this member that can transfer that kind of force. Uh, 
So if the joint is pushing down on the member with a 2P force, then the member must be pushing up on the joint with a 2P force. So we've now walked our way through the system from equilibrium to action-reaction pairs to equilibrium to action-reaction pairs, and we've now arrived at this joint. And that joint, of course, is not an equilibrium at this point because right at the moment we've identified an upward force of 2P, a 0.5P force downward, so there have to be some other members framing into that joint that are going to do what's necessary to keep that joint in equilibrium. But before we jump all the way up there, we'd like to talk about this interaction along this line, because we have one other member that's framing into that joint. And basically, there are no external forces on that joint. That means that the force of this member on that joint has to be zero, because if this member was exerting a force on that joint, then the joint would take off in whatever direction that force was exerted in, because there's nothing else to equilibrate it. So in this uh, system of bookkeeping, we're going to put zero P here, and instead of an arrow, we're going to just draw this blank line because it has no direction. And then we're going to say by action-reaction pairs, if this member is not exerting a force on the joint, then the joint's not exerting a force on the member. By equilibrium, this, there should be a line right here, by the way. Well, I guess these are just dashed lines that I drew across here. There should be a line there, though, that says 0P. So there's no net force on this member. Um, and that means the member cannot be exerting a force on this joint. Um, anytime you have a zero force member, by the way, you should look at the system and ask yourself if that makes sense. And it does in this case because forces are being transferred up here. And this is like a little column at the end. And because of the balance of all the forces, we could imagine taking this member out and nothing catastrophic would happen, except, of course, this could be a bracing member, so if we got a little puff of wind on the side or something, the whole thing would tend to fall over. But basically, you can sense that if you remove this member, it's not a crucial active member in terms of transferring forces and making the system work. It's just at this point, under this load condition, it's a zero force bracing member. So having said that, now we can jump up to this joint and um, we can't go resolve the effect of this member on the joint yet because there's an unknown horizontal associated with this and an unknown horizontal associated with that. So when we go to this joint, we want to go look at vertical forces because the only unknown vertical is the vertical component associated with the action of this member on that joint. So we can figure out what that is. There's a 2P force up due to the action of this member. There's a half a P force down due to the applied loads which means we need another one and a half P downward force. And the only member that can be an agent of generating such a force is this diagonal. So we have a downward force of one and a half P. And then to make sure that the net force is along the diagonal, we need a horizontal component that's 1.5 P. So in this graphic technique, I'm showing components of the diagonal member and I'm showing them as dashed lines to sort of get across the idea that they're not single individual forces. In order to see the entire picture, you have to go find the other dashed vector that's the other component of the diagonal. So this member is pulling down on that joint with a 1.5p force, and it's pulling to the right with a 1.5p force. So, if this member is pulling down on the joint with a 1.5p force, by action-reaction pairs, the joint must be pulling up on the member with a 1.5p force. And likewise, if this member is pulling to the right 
with a 1.5 P force on the joint, then the joint has to be pulling to the left on the member with a 1.5 P force. So we know this from the action-reaction pair there, and this action-reaction pair is what allows us to identify this 1.5 P upward force. So, to reiterate, we found the equilibrium on this joint uh, to determine that there had to be this 1.5 P downward force, and then action-reaction pairs have allowed us to get to the forces on this member. Now, by equilibrium of the member, if there's a 1.5 P force that way, there has to be one this way. If there's a 1.5 P upward force, there has to be a 1.5 P downward force. So we have now established everything we need to know about the equilibrium of this member. Uh, you'll notice along the diagonal, we've written the total force, which is 1.5 P squared plus 1.5 P squared, and then taking the square root using the Pythagorean theorem, or we can say 1.5 P uh, divided by the uh, sine of 45 degrees. So we've resolved the forces in that member. Now these forces on the end of this member had to be exerted by this joint. So if the joint is pulling to the right and pulling downward with 1.5 P forces, then the member must be pulling up and to the left on the joint. So these are the two components of the forces on this joint due to that member. Now we could keep going at this joint if we wanted to. Um, however, it would be prudent to jump back up to this joint and resolve what's happening there. And we're going to do that next. And the reason we want to do that is we don't want to come over to this joint and find our, ourselves short of information. And we don't want to leave this joint that we've visited without completely resolving it. So at this joint, we have this 1.5 P force to the right. That's the only horizontal force. It's the horizontal component being exerted by this member on that joint. The only agent that can equilibrate that is this member. So if there is this horizontal component to the right of 1.5 P due to the action of that member, then there has to be a 1.5 P force to the left on this joint, and that's due to the action of this member. So this member, to keep this joint in equilibrium, is pushing to the left with a 1.5 P force, by action-reaction pairs, if this member is pushing on that joint with a 1.5 P force to the left, the joint must be pushing on the member with a 1.5 P force to the right. Then by equilibrium of this member, if there's a 1.5 P force on the left end to the right due to the action of that joint, then this joint must be exerting a 1.5 P force to the left on the right end of this member in order to keep the member in equilibrium. Then by action-reaction pairs, if this joint is pushing to the left on the member with a 1.5 P force, the member must be pushing to the right on the joint with a 1.5 P force. All right, so now we need to jump back down to this joint because we got kind of started on it when we traced these forces through, but we never did completely resolve it. So we're going to take the next step. Uh, we have the diagonal, we have the uh, vector components of the diagonal force on that joint. Um, and then we have a vertical member here and a horizontal member here that can serve to equilibrate those. And it doesn't make any difference which of those we pick first because we have one unknown in both cases. So we're going to do the vertical. We're going to say 
in order to equilibrate the upward 1.5p force, which is the vertical component of the force that this member is exerting on that joint, this member must be pushing down on the joint with a 1.5p force. If that member is pushing down on the joint with a 1.5p force, then by action-reaction pairs, the joint must be pushing up on the member with a 1.5p force. If there's a 1.5p force on the bottom of this member pushing up, then this joint has to be pushing down on the top of the member with a 1.5p force in order to keep this vertical member in equilibrium. By action-reaction pairs, if that joint is pushing down on the member with a 1.5p force, the member must be pushing up on the joint with a 1.5p force. So now we have to go back to this joint again because we never did resolve the horizontal components. We have a 1.5p force to the left due to the, the horizontal component of this diagonal. There is a zero force member here, so we don't have to account for that. So in order to equilibrate this joint, we have to have a 1.5p force to the left. Excuse me. We have to have a 1.5p force to the right as the action of this member in order to equilibrate this horizontal component of the diagonal here, which is 1.5p to the left. So now this joint's in equilibrium. It has a 1.5p pull to the right by this member. By action-reaction pairs, this joint must be pulling back on the member with a 1.5p force. By equilibrium of the member, it has to have a 1.5p force to the right on the right end, and that force has to be exerted by this joint because the joint is the only agent that can produce that equilibrium, equilibrating force. So by action-reaction pairs, if the joint is pulling to the right on the member, the member must be pulling to the left on the joint with an equal magnitude force. So now we have completely resolved all the forces of this joint, and we have traced those forces through to the adjacent joint here and traced them upward to that joint. Now the question becomes, where do we want to go next? And the answer is we don't want to go here because we have an unknown horizontal, an unknown vertical, and two unknown diagonals. So we have too many unknowns to resolve at that joint. But when we come up here, we discover that we're in pretty good shape to resolve what's happening at this joint. And again, we're going to start with the verticals because um, there's an unknown horizontal here and an unknown horizontal there, but there's only one unknown vertical, and that's from the, uh, the com vertical component of this diagonal action along this line. So we look at this member, we ask ourselves, what's going on vertically? We have a one and a half P force up. We have a one P force down, which means we have a net upward force of 0.5 P or half a P. And this member, therefore, this member has to be pulling down on that joint with a vertical component of 0.5 P. So we draw that in and now our arrows are getting so short we can't even see the dashes anymore. Um, we had dashes over here uh, because the component arrows were long enough, but now we've basically reduced them down to just 0.5p. So now this joint is in equilibrium under the vertical forces. Um, one and a half p up, one p down, half a p down, and they're in equilibrium. Then by geometry, again, we point out that if the vertical component is 0.5p, the horizontal component has to be also. So these are the two components for the force that this diagonal member is exerting on this joint. And those forces, by the way, are directly on the joint, but we can't draw them because all the arrows get on top of each other. But it's understood that as long as we draw both of them, they resolve to a force that's along the diagonal. In other words, the net force is passing through that joint.
So this offset that we've done here just to make things visible and readable is not a, uh, an equilibrium problem uh, due to forces that are inappropriately offset. As long as we understand that both these forces got slid along the diagonal so we could see them, but their net effect is along the diagonal, which is going through the center of the joint. So from a point of view of our force addition uh, requirements, the diagram is still accurate. Okay, so this member is pulling down and to the right on the joint. By action-reaction pairs, the joint has to be pulling up and to the left on the end of the member with components that are equal to the components here. So we have 0.5 to the left, 0.5 up on the ends of this member, then by the equilibrium of the member, this joint has to be applying whatever forces are necessary at this end to equilibrate those forces at the other end. So this has to be 0.5p to match that, and this has to be 0.5p to match that. So now we've taken care of the equilibrium of this joint. We can now do action-reaction pairs by saying that if these two components are on the end of that member due to the action of this joint, then the action reaction pairs tells us that this member must be pulling up and to the left with 0.5p forces on the joint. So now we've worked our way down to this joint and we now know enough information there because we have basically an unknown um, I'm sorry, we don't have enough information there. We have an unknown vertical, an unknown horizontal, and one more unknown associated with, with this diagonal. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to go back up to this joint and, and we'd like to finish resolving it and then we'd like to work our way along this path to get ourselves to that joint. That's a nice simple joint and once we arrive there, if we know whatever is occurring along this transfer path, we'll be ready to work that and then work downward. So we're going to jump back up to joint C and we're going to look at the equilibrium of it. So before I put those numbers there, let's look carefully. Uh, to the right, we got a one and a half P force due to the compression that's transferred along this line. Then we got a 0.5 P tensile force to the right. So in other words, we have two horizontal forces on this joint and they are going in the same direction, so they add up. So this member has to be pushing to the left. This member has to be pushing to the left on that joint with a 2P force. So we will draw that arrow. That is the force of this member on the joint by action-reaction pairs. The joint is pushing back on the member. By equilibrium, we have to have a 2P force on this side to keep this member in equilibrium. That 2P force is exerted by this joint on the member. If that joint is pushing to the left with a 2P force on the member, the member must be pushing to the right with a 2P force on the joint. So we've now arrived at this joint. We have a known vertical, a known horizontal. We have an unknown horizontal and an unknown vertical but this is an extremely simple situation. Uh, summing the verticals first to keep this joint in equilibrium. If there's a 1P force down, this member has to be pushing up on the joint with a 1P force to assure vertical force equilibrium. If the member is pushing up on the joint with a 1P force, then the joint is pushing down on the member with a 1P force. By equilibrium of the member, there has to be a 1P force on the bottom, which is exerted by the joint. If the joint uh, F is pushing up on the bottom of the member with a 1P force, by action-reaction pairs, the member must be pushing down on the joint with a 1P force. Um, and by the way, this is a, an interesting situation to look at. There's no diagonal framing into this joint and so this member is not really playing a role in the overall truss transfer of forces. It's mainly a little strut column that's coming up here uh, 
to uh, support that point force. So we have a 1p force at that point, and rather than try and take it in a long cord member and bending, we're just putting this little strut in, but its action is essentially to counteract that force, but it doesn't have much other role in the overall behavior of uh, the force transfer in this truss. So now I'll jump to the next step and we'll uh, deal with the horizontals at this joint. There's a 2p force to the right on the joint due to this member or the transfer of force through this cord. In order for this joint to be in equilibrium, this member must be exerting a 2p force to the left. If this member is exerting a 2p force to the left on the joint, then the joint is pushing to the right with a 2p force on the member. In order for this member to be in equilibrium, this joint must then push to the left with a 2p force to counteract that 2p force. And then by action-reaction pairs, if this joint is pushing on the end of that member to the left with a 2p force, the member must be pushing the joint with a 2p force to the right. So now we go to the next step where we're going to jump down to this joint. So before we do that, let's take a look and see what's going on. Um, we have an unknown horizontal from here and an unknown horizontal from there, but we only have one unknown vertical and that's associated with this member. And when we look at the vertical forces on this joint, there's a 1p force down, there's a half a p vertical component from this diagonal. So that means there's a net half a p downward which means this member has to be pulling up with a half a p force. And if it's pulling up with a half a p force, it has to be pulling to the right with a half a p force to keep the force along the axial line of the member. So when we look at it like that, we see that we have a half p upward force on the joint due to this member, a half p force to the right on the joint due to this member, and by action-reaction pairs, the joint has to be pulling to the left and downward with a half p force in each case. By equilibrium, we have this force on the end due to this joint. By action-reaction pairs, we have these forces on the joint due to the member. Now, at this point, we're pretty happy. We're going to carry this one step further and deal with the horizontals down here. Um, and when we deal with the horizontals, let me just go back a second. We have 0.5p to the left, 0.5p to the right, 1.5p to the left. That's the only unbalanced force involved, which must mean that um, this member has to be equilibrating that force by pulling to the right. So we have a 1.5p force on this joint due to this member. By action-reaction pairs, the joint is pulling back on the member with a 1.5p force. By the requirements of equilibrium for this member, there has to be a 1.5p force to the right on the right end, which is being exerted by this joint. And then by action-reaction pairs, if the joint is pulling to the right on the member, the member must be pulling to the left on the joint. And we can continue that process uh, by going and examining this joint and continuing to resolve it. The key thing is that we knew we were in pretty good shape when we got to the point where this was in the same state of stress as that, and that diagonal was in the same state of stress as that, because we're dealing with a symmetric truss, and if we didn't see that kind of symmetry, we'd be deeply disturbed. We would fully expect that the right-hand side of the truss and the left-hand side of the truss are behaving in a similar way. So we have this beautiful check, at least on our web members, when we get to the center of a symmetric truss, uh, this last web should be 0.5 and 0.5, and then the one symmetric on the other side should be 0.5 and 0.5. This is not an absolute check, though, because you may have made some mistakes. If this was a much more complicated truss with many, many bays and many joints. Sometimes you make errors uh, accumulating the forces in the cord members. 
So we don't have an asymmetry check because uh, we can make a mistake on this side and by the time we get to this joint, we'll just force a symmetry right there. But there are ways we can check whether the chord force we've gotten at the center or not is the, the appropriate force. And the method we'll use for that is called the sections method and uh, we will get into that uh, later in in our discussions. That ends our second video on trusses, taken from chapter seven, section one, subsection two, in which we have used exploded analysis as a way of performing a very detailed and expressive analysis of a parallel chord truss with four square bays. All the principles that you need to apply this method to other trusses have been properly explicated in this video. However, it is often helpful to go through a second example of this type to make sure that you understand the details and the principles. There is a similar analysis applied to a five square bay truss in section seven, uh, chapter seven, section one, subsection three. In other words, immediately in the book after the four square bay truss analysis. If you have the slightest doubts about whether you understand these principles in detail, you are strongly encouraged to go look at that five square bay example.